warm welcome to um, all of you uh, to this general press conference and particular welcome to our Nobel laureates and economy laureates of 2013 uh, and they are ready to answer your questions. Uh, my name is Stefan Normark and I'm the permanent secretary of the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences. Our academy has uh, awarded the Nobel Prizes in Physics and in Chemistry since 1901, and the Prize in Economical Sciences to the memory of Alfred Nobel since 1968. Um, before we start the discussion, I should mention that our academy is not only engaged in awarding these prizes. We are heavily engaged in, 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 in being an independent voice for science uh, in the society, and we have been that since 1739, so we have a little bit of experience. We work hard to influence science policies and, and policy priorities for science. We try to engage ourselves in different uh, learning programs to support teachers and uh, their teaching in science in the school. We identify, uh, promote young scientists in this country, uh, and I should just say at the end that we have a very recent program now in, in mathematics, funded by the Knut and Alice Wallenberg Foundation, that will support uh, uh, mathematicians uh, from all over the world to spend time here in Sweden. So that's just a few of our things, uh, but of course the most important thing is that we have the laureates here, and I should present them. We have first the Nobel Prize in Physics 2013. That was for the theoretical discovery of a mechanism that contributes to our understanding of the original mass of subatomic particles, and which recently was confirmed through the discovery of the predicted fundamental particle by the ATLAS and CMS experiments at CERN's Large Hydron Collider, and the prize is awarded to François Angler, Université Libre de Bruxelles, Brussels, Belgium, and Peter Higgs, University of Edinburgh, United Kingdom. The Nobel Prize in Chemistry 2013 was awarded for the development of multiscale models for complex chemical systems and is awarded to Professor Martin Karplus. Uh, University, Université de Strasbourg, France, and Harvard University, Cambridge, USA, and Michael Levitt, Stanford University, School of Medicine, Stanford, USA, and Ari Warshall, University of Southern California, Los Angeles, USA. And then to the far right, <coughs> or your far left, the Sveriges Riksbank Prize in Economic Sciences, in memory of Alfred Nobel 2013, uh, for the empirical analysis of asset prices. And the prize is awarded to Eugene Pharma, University of Chicago, Illinois, USA, and Lars Peter Hansen, University of Chicago, USA, and Professor Robert Schiller, Yale University, New Haven, USA. So, uh, uh, these laureates, they are pretty experienced at this time. They have been uh, uh, meeting all kind of press and they have discussed their science and basically they have answered to all kind of questions um, that you could find out to pose to them. So please take the opportunity now to, to, uh, to pose questions to this eminent panel of laureates. It's not every day you have this opportunity, and I'm happy that so many of you are here. Uh, but when you ask a question, please introduce yourself a name and the media that you represent, <coughs> and please use the microphone. So now i am open the floor. If there is any first question that you would like to pose, please go ahead. Here we have one question. Good morning. I have a question to the physics laureate. Um, do you think that uh, the um, uh, amount of money that uh, needed now to uh, build an, uh, or to extend the, the, um, uh, the uh, collider to find the physics behind the, 
the model that uh, is uh, you, you now prove that is uh, that is true, but uh, maybe it's something uh, a smaller from a, from a bigger picture, and uh, there is a frightened in the community that, that we will never know because there will no be another project like that because of money. This one is a. Uh, oh, uh, this what this um, accelerator cost uh, a lot of money, and the public is anti-science today, and uh, also the government. What can you say? Can you answer this? I am not sure I understood everything. Right? But it is uh, uh, if the taxpayer can, <coughs> you think, can uh, afford to continue and even expand uh, uh, the the science at CERN that verified your theoretical discoveries, or what is your feeling? Uh, well, the, the, uh, the, the taxpayer has, has al already funded the, the machine, uh, the LHC, and what was discovered last year is, is just the beginning of, of, a, of, a, of a long program. And the, uh, when the machine starts up again, uh, in 2015, uh, it's certainly hoped that there will be a, a lot more uh, new and interesting discoveries, uh, but uh, continuing to fund the program, uh, which will do that, is uh, a relatively small addition to the uh, amount which has already been in, in invested in building the machine. So it's... Uh, Certainly worth continuing. You have a comment? Well, I would like to ask that the question that, if I understand, is a bit more general, namely that uh, is it worthwhile to spend so much money for uh, the development of fundamental science? Because I think that's what's going on. And uh, clearly there's a lot of huge machine that we need now to do that. I think I would like to make uh, two points with respect to this. That uh, on the one hand, uh, one has to realize that uh, the fundamental research is really at the basis of all practical research and technological research that exists in our present civilization. I mean, it started some 400 years ago, but all that we use, including everything we use in this, in this place and uh, outside in, in your daily life, is the consequence of fundamental research that has gone on from 400 years ago. And uh, so that, I think, is what's happening in CERN is maybe an important investment, but it's just a little bit of the investment that is going on in the whole research or fundamental research. And I want to add to that that there is a second important thing going on with the price that you put in fundamental research, and which has to do not only with the research, but with the uh, spreading of the interest and of the knowledge of the fundamental research, because that thing is extremely important for developing by the um, spreading in cultural exchanges and everything and in the all education, it's important to give some uh, way to acquire the necessary rationality in our life to be able to confront the dangers that are connected with all the uh, uh, ideologies which are dangerous and develop every time and without rationality, one is easily led, and one was led in Europe particularly, to very dangerous type of things. And uh, I think these things justify 
already a lot of money that is involved both in fundamental research and in its spreading in knowledge in the whole population. And I want just to add one thing, that compared to this very large, important enterprise, which is essentially um, aimed at developing peace, there is also, if you compare that amount of money to what is used to build a few warplanes, you will easily find that that amount is negligible. Okay, okay. we have a question there. My name is Johan Schick from Dagens Nyheter in Sweden. I would like to ask the economic laureates uh, about their view uh, on the financial crisis that we had in the last year. So what kind of conclusions you draw, both in principle and uh, concerning policies? Well, policies, I think the, uh, the banks are going to be required to have, or should be required to have much more equity capital so that uh, they won't, they, they're, still, they're too big to fail, but they won't fail if they have enough equity capital uh, use, financing their assets. So I think the required equity capital has to go up a lot. I think that's what the regulators are thinking about, both in the United States and in Europe uh, at this time, is what's the right number? That's, that's a much more difficult answer to give. But we know it has to be a lot higher in order to take too big to fail off the table. Too big to fail is probably the biggest perversion of capitalism you can imagine in the sense that it gives people incentives to take on a lot of risk because they get the upside and we get the downside. Uh, and that's not acceptable. So let me follow up a little bit on that. So to me, to me the financial crisis, there's two pieces to it. One is that um, I'm very interested in the connections between macroeconomics and financial markets, and, and, and it's, it's exposed some gaps in our knowledge, and it's, and it's led to some new modeling challenges going forward. And I think it's very important that we address these in the future. In terms of the uh, financial oversight, let me follow up a little bit on what Gene was saying. Certainly, providing more capital requirements is a, on banks and restrictions is important. There's a danger right now that um, there's a rush towards uh, producing rules that seem to be, you know, relatively complex. That that you're looking at the type of requirement, you know, the type of monitoring that's being required on, on, on these financial institutions. There's a lot of complexity in the assessment of the risk exposures and, and the like, and, I, and it's going to be hard for regulator regulators to meet those challenges because of the uh, uh, because there has a kind of an incoherent aspect to them um, as well as the complexity there's also discussions about we should should we make these capital requirements counter, uh, counter cyclical again to me there, there, there's some basic knowledge which we have gaps we have to fill and that's the links between credit cycles and business cycles and so you know, before we jump to these uh, more elaborate rules I, they, I think we should embrace simple ones until our understanding of the problem becomes more uh, more substantial Okay, coming third, uh, I agree with what you said. I, have, I, I wrote a book called Subprime Solution in 2008, and I have a lot more things to add to these. I think that financial progress has been an important driver of our civilization over centuries, and it needs to continue, that we shouldn't react to this crisis by thinking that uh, we should that there's something evil about derivatives or trading. Uh, in fact, we should expand them in order to help protect people more. So some of the things I talk about in my book are uh, changing our mortgage institutions so that they're more protective of homeowners. We could develop uh, mortgage uh, contracts that have pre-planned workouts, for example. Other thing is developing markets more. I've been working to develop a market for single family homes at the Chicago Mercantile Exchange. If we had better markets, we could have things like home equity insurance that would protect people from bubbles. <coughs> uh, and we could protect government, uh, governments from the kind of crisis we've seen in Europe if, if there were government issues that insulated them from risk. For example, GDP linked bonds instead of the traditional bonds. So there's many things to do. I, I see it as uh, you sound like regulators at the moment. <laughs> I'm, I'm saying it's not all about regulation. It's about development of our institutions at a, 
with more a, a use of financial theory and also a better use of our increased understanding of human nature and the psychological component of all these crises. Okay, thank you. The question there. Thank you. Uh, my name is Masato Nakazawa. Uh, I work for Japanese Newswire Kyodo News. And I would like to ask uh, Professor Hicks and Professor Andre about uh, Professor Yoichiro Nambu. Uh, what are you influenced by Professor Nambu? Uh, and what are you thinking about him? Uh, Nambu. Uh, professor Nambu. Professor Nambu. Oh, Professor Nambu. 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 So here. <laughs> <laughs> well, I must say that uh, you touch a very sensitive point for me because I always um, admired extraordinary Professor Nambu. I think he's one of the greatest figures in physics. And he was, of course, a source of inspiration for me, and I'm convinced that for Professor Higgs also in uh, what led to our discoveries. But I want to add one thing. I had uh, the privilege to know personally uh, Professor Nambu, and uh, for me, he represents really the uh, sum of humanity which I have met in my numerous relations in physics. And I would just want to say one thing. I generally, when I talk to my friend physicist, I talk with the first name. I call them by the first name. But somehow I have that admiration and that respect Professor Nambu, that I could not help any time I met him to tell him, to call him Professor Nambu. <laughs> well, I, I, I simply agree with Francois. Uh, 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 my, my admiration for Nambu's work and his, his, uh, his whole outlook is, is the same as, as well. Francois, he was the inspiration for us all. Okay, thank you. Um, can I come in with, <coughs> let's say, one general question that, that I personally think is important, and, and that is, of course, the, the role. <coughs> I mean, we are a little bit on the older side uh, here, both me and, <laughs> and, the, and the laureates, and the question is really how do we what can we do to, to, to foster a, a, a next generation of young scientists uh, to bring development on for generations to come? If, Professor Levitt? Um, I guess these are on, right? Yeah, you can have a little closer. Okay, so uh, this is an area I've thought about a great deal. I uh, was 20 years old when I started doing the work and it was all done by the time I was 25. I haven't stopped working since then, but it's made me think very much about people beginning independence very early on. And uh, this is a trend that has changed dramatically in the last 40 years. People who were becoming independent at the age of 25, 40 years ago are now becoming independent at the age of almost 40. There's been a massive upward shift. And I think this is something which needs to be dealt with actively to change. I think we have really interesting social phenomena here where the generation, my generation, is essentially the baby boomer generation. We had it really easy, and we haven't really thought enough about helping young people. So I think there needs to be a major effort to make sure that the next generation of great ideas come from people who are in their 20s and not from professors who are in their 60s. And uh, I think this is going to require quite an active uh, intervention on governments, uh, in terms of, uh, it's, it's not quite as bad as the economic market meltdown, but I think it has many of the same trends of positive feedback loops that are self-reinforcing. Professor Coppolis? Yeah, I don't think things are quite as bad as Michael describes. 
obviously, what I know specifically is what happens with my coworkers, who are, you know, many of them in their 20s, and the way I run my research group is that they have a great deal of independence at that age. They publish papers as a senior author, and many of them are sufficiently bright that I think they will go on and become outstanding scientists. So I think to a certain extent, it's up to us as teachers to foster what Michael says is very important, that when you're young and you're most likely to have original ideas, you have the chance to express them. In Europe, things are somewhat worse than in the US, and there I think what Michael says is more correct, that the people have to only become independent, if at all, of their professors at a much higher age. So we do have to watch this, but I think the opportunity is still there, and I wouldn't say that things have really changed that much overall in the world from my experience. Professor Borf? Uh, one issue is the founding and maybe the way to keep young people uh, doing more is to put more in basic research and not in major multidisciplinary projects like with big names. I'm not talking on the, on the physics project. <laughs> And, uh, I mean, the more you put in basic research, the more chances that the money would be shared between many researchers, including young people. You had a comment? Can I just make one extra comment? I did my PhD in Europe, in England. My first seven papers, four of them are sole author papers. I never wrote a PhD with my supervisor, uh, and I think that is the model to follow, not that the students are senior authors, but the senior students are sole authors. I think for me the most amazing example is from two Nobel laureates, Max Perutz and John Kendrew. Max Perutz had an idea about how to solve crystal structures. Kendrew was his PhD student. Kendrew implemented the idea, and Kendrew published a, sole, a paper without Perutz of the paper in 1959, and then got the Nobel Prize together with Perutz in 1962. I think that's the model. People need to be writing papers in their own name in their 20s. Thank you. That's kind of an unwritten law at uh, Chicago, at least in economics and in the business school, that uh, you, people ad advising people on their theses never put their name on the thesis. Mm -hmm. Their whole job, practically, is getting the student to think that they did it all so that they, be <laughs> so, so, okay. so, so that they become independent in, in that process. Uh, okay. We have a question there. Yeah. Uh, David Chandler from Journal of Chemical Physics. A question for the chemistry uh, laureates, please. Um, as the chemists model more and more biology, uh, what are, maybe you could talk a little bit about what the roadblocks are presently to looking at bigger and bigger systems and doing it with higher higher fidelity and how far you think that's going to go? Well, I don't think there are any roadblocks. I think, obviously, it's an evolutionary process as the methods that have been developed become more precise, as the computers become bigger and bigger. There's, there seems to be sort of a, almost continuous uh, growth in the complexity of systems one can study. And uh, I think in the, in the next 10 years, you will see, instead of looking at the uh, individual proteins, you'll be looking at cells, you'll be looking at the nervous system, and it'll just go on. And I think the, so I think we are really at an exciting stage where some of the early ideas where we were limited by both the accuracy of the way we re represented the system, the potential functions, and the computational resources that were available were indeed blocking going to larger systems. But I think now it's, uh, it's an exciting time, and we'll be seeing more and more applications to systems that are of biological importance and that will be able to answer questions that become uh, 
you know, whether we'll be able to go on and certainly when we'll be able to model cells, whether when we'll be able to model a, a whole multicellular being or not, probably. So uh, since the mid-60s, computer power has increased by a thousand million fold, <laughs> an American billion. And uh, that's a large number. And I think what's interesting in looking back is that most of that computer time has been spent on running larger systems for longer time. Very little has been spent on making the representations better. In fact, in some ways, we're using simpler models now than we used 50 years ago. I think there's going to be a switch going forward to a new generation of force fields that actually do include more quantum mechanical effects directly and not only in the hybrid way. So I believe that we, we need to, it's spending computer time is a bit like spending resources. Most of it has gone into longer calculations and bigger systems. We need to now start to have better calculations maybe on smaller systems. But it's going to be a seesaw both ways. Uh, one of the problems is really that now everybody could run a modeling program, but knowing what to do with it is a process that takes education. How do you present the question? How you model something? And this might be essentially the bottleneck if, you, if biologists want to ask questions. He needs the training to know what to ask rather than just running the program. And uh, with younger people learning how to ask questions rather than just running programs, I think that uh, a lot of system could be modeled, probably will not be able to model emotions or other things, at least on a molecular level, but uh, cellular system would be modeled sooner, sooner or later reliably. I have a question there. My name is Corina Negra. I'm coming from Radio Romania Science Department. I, I have two questions. Uh, following a previous question about the young generation, how do you motivate young generation to go into science? Um, what made you go into science, first of all? And then the second question is, uh, the, the second question is related to the fact that a lot of um, researchers who have built their, their careers in the US are going now back to, the, to, to Europe to some of their countries. Is this a sign to be worried? Is, is there a problem with the, the, the American model of um, funding science research? Thank you. Anyone that can also that? So I guess uh, just to break the order, I, I don't think we need to stick with alphabetical order. Um, I think that uh, I, actually, I actually went into science because of a TV program that I saw, I'd never seen TV before. I got to England in 1963, and John Kendrew had a TV program on, called The Thread of Life, which really impressed me, probably because I was, I'd never seen TV before. So I think, I would argue everyone here should be on Twitter and on Facebook, because the generation is no longer TV, and I think motivating young people means talking their language, not talking our language. Um, I think in terms of the uh, trend away from the USA, I think these things always have a balance. Right now, the USA has a surplus of about 35% Nobel Prize winners, i.e. people who were not born there, but who got the prize there. And most European countries have a deficit. So in terms of the Nobel Prize balance of trade, the USA is way ahead. It needs to move back. I think that, uh, you know, as, I, I think systems need to rebalance, but I don't see any crisis at all. I think, I think there could have been a crisis in the USA, if Europe had managed itself better. But I think we were saved by the European financial management, which was just about as bad as ours. Okay. Well, actually, be before the Second World War, Germany had two and a half times the number of Nobel Prize winners than the US. During the war, many of the people who had got Nobel Prizes came to the US and this immigrant group of both intelligent, driven young people and older, already formed people gave the United States its dominance in Nobel Prizes. 
And I think, as you know, Michael says, I think now it's going backwards some, in certain ways. And part of it is that, at least from my own experience, that uh, many young people are finding it very hard to get jobs in research, in universities, where they will know they will be funded. And they have two choices. They, you know, if they're really bright, they can work for some financial company and make a lot of money. Or they go back, or they go to Europe, where the finance, financing in, in Germany and in, other, in England is better than in the US in this, these days. And you know, the science is international. I don't think it's really a problem in terms of where it is done. The important thing is that it continues to be done. OK, thank you very much. I think uh, time is running out. And, and uh, thank you for the questions, and thank you for the answers. Um, I'd like also to invite you tomorrow to the Nobel Lectures in Aula Magna. It starts at 9 o'clock. You don't need to register to attend the lectures. <coughs> and then some of you uh, have listed up for exclusive interviews uh, after this press conference. And the press attaché will, will now show you uh, to the right location and the right laureate. <laughs> so, again, thank you very much. And uh, I close this uh, press conference. Thanks. And an applaud to all the laureates. <laughs>